Well, ladies and gentlemen, if we might be uh, refreshed after your tea. Um, start again, this is uh, the Room 1000 breakout session. Uh, free speakers, uh, more as I say, on uh, technical type matters. So first speaker is uh, Brian McIntyre. Brian is Project Executive with Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. He's building the SEAI Deep Retrofit Program towards upgrading the Irish residential building stock to an A3BR rating. Uh, Brian joined uh, SEAI in 2017 to develop the re retrofit program, which has been tasked with uh, developing a model for the rollout of a large-scale uh, national deep retrofit initiative. Uh, this involves assessing projects for funding for a suite of solutions for different residential building types with a fabric-first approach and the deployment of renewable uh, technologies, especially uh, factored in. Uh, Brian's a graduate of UCD, uh, holding a, a BSc in Experimental Physics and an MSc in Environmental Engineering. Uh, today he'll give us an update on progress of the Deep Retrofit Programme. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Martin. Um, like I said, my name is Brian McIntyre and I work with the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. So I'm just going to talk to you a bit today about the Deep Retrofit Pilot Project, um, why we've developed it, uh, what it is, uh, how it works and how we deliver to an A3 standard, as Martin said, um, and the opportunities for the industry um, with the Deep Retrofit Pilot Programme, and just some early results for we have from the first pro projects that we've had in. So we have kicked off the programme in June, the middle of June at our first conference last year, so it's still very much in its infancy, so the results so far are very uh, provisional. So, at SAAI, our vision is of a low carbon economy for 2050, uh, with this based on sustainable, secure, clean energy, and to develop new energy solutions. In order to do that, we need to use less energy, we need to use clean energy, and to develop new energy solutions. And leading the transition to smarter and more sustainable energy activities is central to what we do. Just in terms of the overview of our, of our pilot programme, what it is, the context it's set in, in terms of vision and policy, um, who it's for, so our target market, and how we've developed the programme, how we do it in terms of how SEI incentivise it and how we deliver it on site, um, achieving A ratings, so the design and delivery of projects, and the opportunities for the market and value proposition for the homeowners. So what is it? What is the context for the development of a deep retrofit program? Well, in 2017, we published our five-year strategy document. Um, and in it, it was a key challenge for SEI was the requirement for large-scale and deeper retrofit within our built environment in order to maximize energy efficiency. And within those, then, there's associated challenges of the development of appropriate technical solutions. There's not every building is the same. There's lots of different building types, age profiles, and performance levels in terms of energy. You also have the consumer awareness of what a deep retrofit is, what energy efficiency means for your house, and the adoption of deep retrofit, because it's a significant amount of money involved in, in bringing your house up to an A3. And then the finance models. Again, like it's a significant amount of money, and, and this kind of puts people off that to spend 10, 20,000 on a house uh, to bring it up to an A3, especially when it's, it's very much an intangible thing to a lot of people. <coughs> to look at models that maybe pay as you save models to be introduced for a residential market where it takes out the upfront hit and the capital costs initially, and they pay it back for the works over time. We also have the forthcoming building regulations. Um, Eamon Smith's going to talk about this today. Um, but they're very much uh, framed in the context of the Energy Performance in Buildings Directive, which requires that all new buildings uh, to be nearly zero energy buildings by the 31st of December 2020. So in terms of those for domestic buildings, that'll mean a 25% improvement on the current regulations. <coughs> and an involvement of 10 to 20 percent of energy from renewable sources. And again, major renovations will have an impact on that as well, that if you're doing a certain level of work on your house to bring it up to a standard, you'd be expected to achieve of the order of a B3. So this is the, the context that the Deep Retrofit program is framed in. So what is a Deep Retrofit? Well, our working definition is that Deep Retrofit is the significant upgrade of a building towards nearly zero energy requirements for practically feasible and achievable. All that really means is that we're driving up the energy efficiency of a house, driving down the energy demand to run the house. 
So the, the guiding principles that, are, that underpin the program, that you have to achieve an A3 of a building energy rating and an uplift of 150 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. So it's driving down a minimum requirement to re reduce the level of energy consumption in the home. It's a whole house solution, but it's based on a fabric first approach. So you address the fabric and the insulation of the house to reduce the energy demand, and then you use energy systems that have a much lower load. We're also going for the deployment of renewable systems. We're not funding fossil fuels, so no more gas or oil boilers. We also ensure good in indoor air quality through mechanical ventilation systems. And again, another element is to support the comfort and health benefits that we see from um, an upgraded energy efficient home. And again, the ventilation. So the pilot program was announced um, in the National Mitigation Plan, which funded for 2017 to 2019, which is a bit different. We never usually get that level of multi-annual uh, approach from the department in terms of funding. We've got a five million budget allocation in 2018. And ultimately, the pilot's going to inform the large-scale rollout of a, a deep retrofit program following the, the pilot 2020. So we'll know what's, what are the optimal solutions for different building types, different building age profiles, and what works. So we can roll it out like the other programs so the homeowners can come and ask for a grant. And it's for the residential market only, and a minimum of five homes per project. And again, that's just that anyone a project owner comes to us. It's about the logistics from the market side, that they can deliver <coughs> more than just a single house. We have over one million homes to up upgrade the need to be able to deliver to a, a certain level of scale rather than doing one-off houses because we'll never achieve our targets if it's just based on one-off delivery. So who is it for? We know there's about 800,000 building energy ratings in the country and the CSO have extrapolated that for the whole building stock and there's of the order of one million homes that are rated from a C3 down to a G. In the National Renovation Strategy in 2014, it was estimated that it would have cost 35 billion to upgrade the building stock or the housing stock uh, to a minimum of B3 by 2050. So that's 35 billion to bring the housing stock to a B3. And we're looking to go to an A3. So in terms of the pilot program development, we had our basic principles underpinning the development of the program, the fabric first, the A3. Well, we spoke to over 200 different stakeholders in the years since last February or March when we first started the program. And the kind of the feedback we got from different stakeholders engaged in terms of policy, it kind of concurred with where we're going in terms of fabric first approach and renewables only. We spoke with influencers internationally and they looked at the Bonfield review of, of deep retrofits in England. And they said actually this, the SR54 document, the code of practice that the NSAI produced for the energy efficiency upgrades, is a pretty good uh, basis for, uh, for standards and specifications and quality in Ireland. They also looked at the upskilling for professionals, so architects, QSs, engineers, in terms of designing for deep retrofit, and the emerging uh, nearly zero energy building standards coming into play in part L of the building regulations. In terms of supply chain, contractors, the upskilling and contractor working on site, delivering deep retrofits, it's different to standard building practices in terms of what's involved, in terms of external insulation, detailing, thermal bridging, heat pumps, and as well with the maintenance of contractors on site, a lot of our programs, the higher volume programs with SEI, the Better Energy Communities, for example, they operate in a window, say, from about April or May up until October. And there's such a high level of work going on then, a lot of times contractors have to let go of some of the staff that have been trained up on site. And they don't get those, they don't maintain those people working on site. And there's no substitute for experience. So what we were looking to do is roll the program around all year round so that people can maintain the staff on site, maintain that skills, training, and experience and improve the quality of what's being delivered. And in terms of the customers then, the homeowners, the trusted advisor, have someone independent there to uh, talk them through the best solution for them and their home. And it just gives them a level of comfort that someone's not just trying to tell them something, they're actually invested in helping them come up with the best solution for their home. And as well, the customer engagement and uh, post-building uh, evaluation, it's about taking the homeowner through the whole process from start to finish. So we're talking through the whole solutions or the different suite of solutions, what's in it for them, how to benefit them, and talking through the benefits, and just basically managing their expectations throughout the delivery of the project. And the post-building evaluation, it's basically a survey after the fact just to see how they found the process, <coughs> how they found the works, do they find technologies difficult to use. I suppose it informs the delivery of the projects down the line. And some of the key points we got out of it was that Rick Holland from Innovate UK, who ran the Retrofit for the Future program, so the retrofit's not rocket science, but it is complicated. 
And it is when you're talking about a whole house solution, where you're bringing a house potentially from a G up to an A3. It's a whole house solution and everything's integrated and it's not a piecemeal delivery like we see someone putting wall insulation in or roof insulation in and it has to work. Brought through the importance as well of pre-works assessment and design because you're de designing for a whole house solution based on an assessment of the property in the first place and that the approach and delivery of the works is integrated and coordinated. And again, the end-to-end -end engagement with the homeowner and house occupier in terms of local authorities just to talk them through it, make sure they got buy-in from the start. Again, stressing the importance of assessment and design. You do an assessment beforehand, it informs your appropriate design, and design is critical for delivery of a whole house solution. And that it's integrated for the delivery of the works. Again, it comes down to technical issues, the thermal bridging design is critical, especially at corners and junctions and edges. And addressing the interfaces between fabric and systems will address the issues around air tightness as well designing for use. So if you've got a mechanical ventilation system with heat recovery and you've got filters, you need to design that so the first homeowner has access to the filters so they can change them. It's simple things like that. It's, it's, it seems like a very simple thing, but it, it makes a big difference in terms of the operation and the efficiency of a system. So this is kind of a simplistic um, representation of a kind of a traditional approach where your project manager and he says to the BR assessor, I need the pre-works VR for that house, the insulation contractor, I need wall insulation for that house, roof insulation, heating system contractor, put in a new boiler. And it's all very, they're all operating in their own little silos and there's no integration between the different disciplines. But in terms of the deep retrofit, when you have to deliver a house to an A3 and there's lots of very different issues, you're gonna have different things. The designer will specify one system, um, the insulation contractor said that's not gonna work. Can we do it this way? Will it have a knock-on impact on the, um, on the ventilation contractor and the renewals, the heating? And the VR assessor is involved throughout. So everyone's integrating, working and designing and collaborating initially at the design stage. And you've got the homeowner as well. I mean, it's their home. It's critical that they like it. If you've ever watched Room to Improve, you know how much of an impact it has on a, home, a homeowner. And it's, it's like they're going to live in the house for the foreseeable future. So it's important that they've invested, I suppose, mentally and, and financially in terms of the work that's being done. Again, some critical success factors that we've seen across uh, through our experience and through international best practice, that the design, it is a whole house pro project. The thermal bridging detail as well, uh, designing for air tightness and provision of adequate ventilation, so control ventilation. We're requiring that the ventilation is provided by mechanical ventilation systems rather than being left at natural ventilation because it can control the venti a mechanical ventilation system and it orders an appropriate level of ventilation for homeowners and maintaining indoor air quality and reducing the surface condensation risks. Again, the customer engagement, end-to-end -end, uh, interaction with the homeowner so that they know the different stages of delivery. So how do we do it? How do we do it as an organization in terms of delivering it? How do contractors in different disciplines, um, how do they deliver an A3? So for us, we're offering 50% grant. That covers uh, the actual capital works. And it's also covering the project management of works, so the management of the actual works on site, but also the design, um, the architect's designs, uh, the BR assessor's designs in terms of how you deliver an A3. I'll go into that in the, in the next couple of slides. But setting the standard, but setting the bar at the A3 and underpinning all the works with the, uh, the SR54, the NSAI uh, document on the code of practice and our own code of practice that will flesh out different issues within that for different technologies. And again, about supporting the comfort and the health benefits of a deep retrofit uh, upgrade. We're working with the HSE and other programs um, to determine the, the, uh, the, uh, the impact of um, an energy efficiency upgrade on the, uh, the health of someone with a chronic respiratory um, disease. And again, about supporting capacity. That's the reason we have a uh, delivery of five homes per project. It's about building capacity in the market, getting contractors involved, giving them the confidence that they can deliver to an A3. And achieving the A rating, we've dealt with a lot with contractors so far, and one of the issues that they have is, well, I know for a deep retrofit involves external wall insulation, for example, <coughs> roof insulation, new windows, possibly triple glazed windows, new heating system, heat pumps, uh, mechanical ventilation. And I've done all that. I know someone who can help me with that but I don't know if I'm going to achieve an A3. It's that confidence in, in knowing that what I do on site or what I know I can do being translating through to the BER rating at the end of it. The important thing is for a contractor is to engage with a BER assessor. So a professional, it could be an architect, 
could be a QS engineer or just a VR assessor with a certain level of quali qualification. They'll do the pre-works VR in the house, and they'll essentially design through the deep software a roadmap to delivering A3. So they'll say, this is where your starting point is with your wall insulation, your attic insulation, your windows, your roof, your floor, your heating system efficiency, air tightness level. Say, this is where it needs to be to achieve an A3. So essentially, they'll specify the level of insulation you need, the types of windows you need, the efficiency of your heating system, in order for you to get from where your starting point is to an A3, or an A2, or an A1. Again, your air tightness tester, an air tightness tester is required at the start of a project. The air tightness tester will come out, carry the test, and he'll be able to advise on improvements in terms of air tightness as well. It also allows you to identify the efficiency of the heat pump system that you'll need to install to deliver the A3. So it's important that the assessor isn't just engaged in design and specifying of the different U values within the house, but that it's also delivered there in terms of specification with the contractor, ensuring that what the contractor is putting in on site A is the appropriate documentation that they can allow the value to be put into the deep software, but B that it actually works, that it's going to deliver the, the U values that you need to. So again, in terms of newer technologies, and that's, this is kind of the, the scary part of for some contractors in terms of heat pumps. It's a relatively new technology in terms of how it's been its use in Ireland, especially in a retrofit scenario. So ha by having designed your roadmap with the BR assessor in terms of what level of efficiency you need from your heating system to achieve an A3, you then identify the suppliers of a heat pump system and engage and say, I need a heat pump that's 400% efficient for space heating and 210% efficient for water heating. Then they'll work with you and say, well, we have this heating system, but it'll depend on your pipe work and your radiators. You may or may not need new radiators or pipe work depending on the flow rates that you're required to achieve the, the efficiency in terms of radiators, because the low temperature heating, you'll more often than not require larger radiators, depending on the, the ones that are there. But again, they're part of the design. Mechanical ventilation systems, the, the, the specifications there for the fan power are designed in SR54 and are code of practice. So it's about <coughs> engaging with the, the suppliers again to find what system works best for your design. And again, it's important to keep discussing with the, the BR professional. So these are some examples of works we've actually carried out in site, just to give you an idea of the detailing that's involved in practice. So our early projects, we had about 42 homes that came to us from um, probably the middle, start of August last year that have been delivered, so scattered around the country there. And this particular project was delivered by Wexford County Council. Uh, it's just outside Wexford town. And you have uh, four or three four-unit terraces there inside the town, all starting off with a range of F and G ratings. Um, it was served by Wexford County Council in conjunction with Carlock and Kenny Energy Agency, which has been renamed to Three Counties Energy Agency. And the energy value, the starting point of your energy consumption for the mid-terrace houses was 595 kilowatt hours per meter squared. And for the end of the terrace, it was an average of 753 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. And just to put that into context, a BER rating of an A3 has a consumption of less than 75 kilowatt hours per meter squared. So the houses there, in terms of an A3, were using eight times more energy than an A3 would for the mid-terrace houses, and 10 times more energy than an A3 would for the mid-terrace houses. So you can see the difference in the, the, the uh, we'll have to the consumption to bring it up to an A3 on those houses. They were built in the late 60s, with cavity wall construction, very little insulation, and, and uh, poorly poor efficiency oil boilers. In terms of the works that were being done, the walls were brought from a U-value 0.16, or 0.6 to 0.2 with external insulation. <laughs> Uh, the roof was brought from 0.4 to 0.12 with 400 millimeters of rock wool. Windows uh, came from 3.1 down to point, actually it changed slightly, it's 0.8 watts per meter square Kelvin. They are triple glazed windows and the doors also were 0 0.8. Ventilation system, it's a demand control ventilation system. And the heat pump was 530% efficient with fully integrated controls. The air tightness was brought down from 5.1 to less than 4. And it's a 1.7 kilowatt peak output uh, solar PV system on the roof. So in terms of the uplift, this is what your starting point was for the mid terrace on the end of the terrace, just to give you an idea of the scale of the actual reduction in consumption. So in terms of on site, there's the external insulation going on. Just some details, you can see the fire barrier here on the left hand side, just separating between the, the boundary between two properties. <coughs> this is the first layer of it, just got a lamella, so it's like very condensed uh, rock wool or mineral wool. That's a barrier between two units, and that's what's required under um, SR54. And as well, these houses were insulated externally, 
but the audience, the NSAI certificate say that best practice is to reduce the potential for thermal looping in the cavity. You either seal the cavities, but best practice is to pump the cavities. You can see on the left and right hand side, you can see the holes at the top of the wall where the cavities are pumped in silver insulation. Again, in terms of thermal bridging, you can see in the very left, you can see where they removed the soffit or starting to remove the soffit to bring the attic with the roof wall insulation up to the roof insulation. Um, because if you don't do that, you'll end up like the wall insulation will be like that, the roof insulation will be like that, and you have a big gap there where heat has just been lost out through it and it increases the risk of surface condensation and mold blowing in that junction at the corner. So you're essentially trying to bring it up into the soffit to meet the roof insulation. And similarly down the floor level, SR54 again specifies that to reduce thermal bridging at the floor and wall junction, you bring the, in the external insulation 150 millimetres below floor level. So you can see they dug a, an eight millimeter trench um, at the wall level and bring the insulation down below the below floor level. So both those pictures on the right hand side are bring it down below ground level. And that's the, the white piece of insulation there is what's going down below floor level. It's been waterproofed at the higher density, so it's more robust. And that's, you can just see it's kind of a, a broader picture there. Again, it's just a bit more detail. You can see the windowsill has been removed on the left-hand side because you have to replace with the external insulation. You have to, the windows be brought out and put new windowsills on. So, in terms of the opportunity and value proposition, the opportunity is there in the market for delivery of uh, deep retrofit projects. Where we are at the minute, we're starting. The left is where we are at the minute, and the right is where we need to get to. So we're pretty much at the, on the, at the minute, we're at the lack of deep retrofit service providers. There's not, there's not many people you can go to. If you want to get deep retrofit or you want to bring your house to an A3, who do you go to? There's very small, uh, players, very few players in the market that actually you can go to at the minute. What we're seeing is contractors that have worked on projects, uh, different projects across different programs, is that they've got the confidence once they've delivered an A3 project and they're move, starting to move their business towards deep retrofit. I spoke to one contractor, he does a lot of energy efficiency works. Um, he said it makes more sense for him, rather than go into, there was one contract for 50 houses for a local authority that you put in 50 boilers and 50, attic, 50 houses of attic insulation. He said that's 50 problems. You have 50 homeowners you might have an issue with, 50 boilers you might have an issue with. But it's for the same level of work, the same value of work, you could deal with maybe two, maybe three homeowners. You can spend more time with them, deliver a better level of work. So there's, better, there's a business proposition there to move into the deep retrofit market. And then over time, you'll see the formation of more service providers. Maybe contractors who are operating now, they'll bring the expertise in or they'll form networks with their heat pump contractors, ventilation contractors, and come together that we'll have a market whereby people will know who to go to if they want to get a deep retrofit. And then ultimately, we'll have the uptake of private investment, homeowners investing in deep retrofit projects. In terms of the value proposition of an energy efficiency upgrade, we're always talking about kilowatt hours and savings and payback. The reality is, there's a lot more to it than that. It's a bit more nuanced. The comfort of your home is a big deal for a lot of people. Walking into a home that's not cold, or a home that's warm and comfortable that you actually like being in is a big deal for a lot of people. They did a program in, the, in Wales through the Carbon Trust, and while they didn't actually save money over after the first year because the increase in energy costs, and um, the homeowners actually just turned on the same level of, uh, of heating as they had before, but the house was cold before. You might have had the heating on for five hours a day or eight hours a day, but it was just going straight out through the windows, walls, floors, everything, and it was uncomfortable and it wasn't pleasant to be in. And they were all hugely happy with the level of, of the investment in it because it was a comfortable home. In terms of health in your home, we're already seeing early uh, evidence through our work with the HSC and the Warmth and Wellbeing Program that's having a, a significant reduction in visits to the doctors for people with chronic respiratory illnesses. And the, that's part of the reason for the requirement for mechanical ventilation because it maintains a good level of indoor air quality. We've seen with NUI Galway, they have done a study on shallow retrofits where homes were bought from a D to a C rating, and there was a significant disimprovement in the, or a sig significant increase in the concentration of indoor air pollutants. Because you're increasing, you're increasing the air tightness of the house by doing some of the works, but if you're not providing an extra level of ventilation or controlling the ventilation rate in the house, you're not removing those pollutants and it makes it a less healthy atmosphere to be in. It also increases the value of your home. The ES ESRI did a study in 2015 that said all of the things being equal, an A-rated house compared to a D-rated house will have 9.2% higher value. And you have a new home, especially if you do something like external insulation where you're wrapping the house in it. It's a big difference in the, uh, the aesthetics of the house and everyone likes to see the house looking much better. It's, it, they buy into that. 
by into aesthetics. So in terms of the early results, like I said, we have 42 homes in funded under 2017 funding. So our average consumption free works uh, in terms of VER rating was 465 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. But in context, anything above 450 is a G rating. So the average across all of the homes was 465. So 48% of those start off with a D rating, 3% an E rating, 17 or an F rating, and 31% a G rating. You're probably asking why it's, it's so high if it's only 31% or G rating. Some of the houses were 900, 1,000. One house was 1,100 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year consumption. So not all Gs are equal, like you're talking about twice as bad as a, something that's just into a G rating. And the air permeability of the house, which is a measure of the, height, the loss of air and heat out <coughs> around the fabric, was 8.8 .8 meters cubed per hour per meter squared. In terms of postworks, our average consumption was brought down from 465 down to 54 kilowatt hours per meter squared, which is just above an A2 rating, which is a 50, 50 and below. And the average air permeability was 4.31 meters cubed per hour per meter squared. The average uplift then from beginning to end was 416 kilowatt hours per meter squared. And see, that's the improvement of the order of between 220 and from 1122 kilowatt hours per meter squared. That's the improvements, the little difference we made to the homes. The average energy savings then for home was 24,000 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year, with an average savings of 86% on your energy. CO2 savings per home were 6,963 kilograms of CO2 per year. And the average cost of the works per kilowatt hour saved is one euro 55. Just to add in, like it's all very good kind of quantifying things in terms of VR before and after. We've also required that three years of monitoring of the electricity or the energy consumption in the house. So we could actually compare the theoretical with the performance of the house. There's going to be issues around that in terms of it'll take, it could take a year for someone to figure out how to use the heat pump most efficiently in the house. But you should see a trend over time that the energy consumption will drop. But ultimately what we want to see is that the design and performance gap is minimized. So that's why we bring in the MNV. Thank you. Just, you lads want to come down to the seats over here? Okay, I might have your attention, ladies and gentlemen. It's just a, a few people moving between rooms. Uh, so, uh, very interesting work uh, from Brian, I'm uh, sure, and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, ongoing results as we go through. Maybe we'll get you back to speak to us again. Um, our second speaker um, struck me in, in my job as a GMIT lecturer. I attend many seminars, presentations, CPD events, etc., during the year. And for the past year, um, one of the worst I attended and also one of the very best I attended uh, had the building regulations in common. Uh, so you'd be very pleased to know that uh, the very best one was presented by uh, Eamon Smith, uh, who's our next speaker. Uh, so Eamon is advisor to the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government uh, in the area of building regulations, building standards and control. He's worked extensively over the years in the development of the technical guidance documents that we all use 
and development of standards for both raid on remediation and inspection protocol for legacy septic tank issues following the intervention by the European Court of Justice. Uh, Eamon is a Galway man, uh, St. Jarliffs, and then on to NUIG, where he graduated as a civil engineer. And uh, he'll update us today on uh, recent and uh, near future changes to the building regulations. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I think we are just about afternoon. My, as he said, my name is Eamon Smith. I'm a civil engineer, work with building standards. Um, I suppose, first of all, the, this morning uh, thing was interesting insofar as, uh, and disappointing at the same time, in that the ACOM says that the quality is third on the list and cost is the first. And we've been working very hard to kind of get quality up there, so it's a, a bit disappointing. I saw on the other side, the construction industry were, prepared, were, were in favor of BCAR, which is actually good considering the hammering we got on it. Uh, today, I, I, I put up what next, because most people go, what next are they going to come up with for, for uh, the building standards? And um, I'm going to do a very quick run through of what we're at and what, where we're going. Uh, any of you that have heard me speak before know I can do an hour on any one of the building regulations, so to try and cover four, four different sections of it uh, uh, is going to be a, a, pretty, a pretty rapid uh, um, is overview. So, let's go. Um, building Control Act is where, ge where the power comes from. That gives the minister the power to do the building control regulations and the building regulations. Building control regulations, as I said, you're all sick to death of them. They're the they're, uh, they're BCAR, lodgement of plans, design certifiers, and whatever. Uh, that's all in place. It's been in place since 2014, and it is having an effect absolutely. People are now looking, whereas before they signed certs, now they're, they're, now they're statutory, uh, they're statutory certs, they're actually liable, and uh, they're now being very cautious about what they sign. Behind that, what's happening, we have the BCMS system, the Building Control Management System, and at the front end of that, we're, going, we're, we're now in the process that we're talking about in, uh, innovative technology and whatever. We're, we're working to uh, be able to put both fire safety certs and DAC applications online in that system. Behind the system, we're, doing a, we're, we're uh, introducing a risk analysis. So when you fill out the form and you say you're a multi-story building or you're a timber frame multi-story building or something else like that, it flags it up as a higher risk than other buildings. And then the inspections by the Building Control Authority will be done on a risk, uh, a risk basis. That's where we're going with that. The Building Control Officers themselves will actually have handheld uh, app systems where they can download any of the, the forms you've actually uh, put in. Uh, that you put online uh, when you were uh, putting it in for validation you're, uh, at your commencement notice stage, it will also have uh, be able to get uh, do all of the all of the plans and all of that. Um, oh, I must have been clicking on things. Right. Uh, <coughs> on the other side, we have the building regulations. That's really what I'm talking about uh, today. One of the points I would make is that you know achieving all on the right hand side under the building control gets you no place. The whole purpose of them on the right-hand side is so that the building regulations are complied with, to make a building safe for people in and about buildings. That's the, that's the, the aim, if you like, that's the mission of the building regulations is to make, uh, uh, is to, uh, for the health and safety of people in and about buildings. That's what they're there for. Their controls in place so that we might achieve that. There was a, a delegation over from Norway recently and when I asked them, do they, do, do they have a robust system like that? No, they don't. Do they have a problem with compliance? No, they don't. When they introduce a regulation, the builders and the, the designers and everything take it all on board. We haven't achieved that yet. Okay, so if you haven't been in the game uh, since the downturn, you'll see that we've done a hell of a lot of work, good or bad. You can decide on that yourselves. But basically, uh, that's where we've gone with all of those. Where we are, I don't know whether I can point with this thing. Yes. Poor old part, uh, part C is back there. We're trying to do it. I started it back in 2014 and got sidetracked into fire and part L, uh, mainly fire. And uh, so we're still, we're, we're still trying to work on part C. But um, uh, from that point of view, we are starting work under the pyrite, uh, pyrite report and indeed the blocks report. Uh, it, it's recommended that part C comes out. You know part C SR21 for a hardcore was revised because of the issue that we had with pyrite. Um, 
Uh, I keep pressing that by mistake. So, what I'm going to talk about today actually is B and L. They're the ones that are on the cards that are being done substantially. And as I say, Part C, we have initiated some work on it. Uh, we're looking at maps, wind maps, uh, uh, wind driven rain, uh, um, uh, spell maps, uh, uh, highest and lowest temperatures for affecting on, on steel and stuff like that. Uh, the other bit that that Part C is becoming a very serious document because. We, we're looking at renders as well, monocouche renders, single coat renders, uh, external insulation, different, the, the whole ball game has changed. If you think about it, you go back, you look at the document right now, you, all you have is a mention of cavity walls. But now we have single leaf systems with external insulation. Uh, my SEAI colleague there mentioned, mentioned it, they're doing it in a retrofit. They're also doing it in new. But you have to have a situation where will, is, it, is it robust enough for the Donegal coast when the winds are lashing in off the sea? This is where we're, dividing, where we're developing the wind maps and whether they are appropriate or not uh, in certain areas, whether uh, certain types of construction. Other side of that, rain screen. You saw, the, you saw the issue in Grenfell. The rain screen went up like a candle. Uh, that's a, another issue. From the Part C point of view, we're looking at it. From the Part B point of view, we're looking at it. Okay, so Part B. What? This, 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 this is like a, a gun. Um, so basically, Part B started in 2012. We went out for what, the, what we call a pre-revision consultation. We got 44 submissions, actually over 1,000 comments. We also set up a working group uh, of stakeholders to actually review the comments and uh, come up. What did they come up with? They came up with the idea of having two volumes, one for dwelling houses, that made it more simple to understand how you complied and how you got safety in dwelling houses. It's interesting, though, the statistics show that 80% of the fatalities uh, in fires are actually in dwelling houses. We're inclined to think of multi-story buildings, we're trying to think of apartment blocks. No, 80% happy happen in actually dwelling houses. So the, the document dwelling houses, volume two we now call it, is specific, uh, specific for dwelling houses, and then the other one we're going to have buildings other than dwelling houses. The, uh, the dwelling houses document came out and is applicable, it was published in 2017, and that is actually applicable from the 1st of July 2017. This is the legislation. What did we do? Well, we changed just a tiny bit up there, and I'll explain that in a second. Normally when we do a, le when we do a regulation, we basically take out the previous legislation, and drop in the new one in the second schedule of the building regulations, uh, 1997. We didn't do that this time because we wanted the legislation to stay in place for buildings other than dwelling houses. So we dropped in B6 to B, B11 in it. We already had B1 to B5, if you've ever looked at Part B of the building regulations. So now we have B6 to B11 dealing specifically with dwelling houses. Um, it supplies uh, the existing legislation stays. And it allowed an early transition. People came out to me, what about a transition period? You don't need one. We didn't want one because we're not changing anything substantially in the house. We're changing alarms, we're changing escape routes, excuse me, but we're not actually changing, we're not actually changing anything that would, that would affect your planning permission uh, or that would immediately change. So there you have. What did we change in the legislation? Now this is the legislation, not the TGD, remember. Always there is a difference. Uh, so what we did is we, we put in a means of warning. Before this, it was just escape. We put in means of warning and escape in case of fire, and a dwelling should, uh, house shall be so designed and constructed that there are appropriate provisions. I put in that specifically. I wanted that put in because there was an argument, or at least I saw a legal argument there, that you could say, well, I provided an adequate escape route. You had the lads sitting and still sitting on the stairs there. We don't design for that, lads. You're actually supposed, that's supposed to be a clear way so that in the event of fire, everyone legs it out there and they're not tripping over ye and your bags on the floor. And that's the actual point. Uh, you, so by putting in that stairs, you could say, well, I, I provided the escape route. Now we wanted, and there was an extrapolation that was within the TGD, but it wasn't in legislation. It's now in legislation. You must have an escape. The other thing is dwelling house. That was just a new definition. Dwelling house is a, is a dwelling that is not a flat. That's because dwelling and flat are already defined in legislation. TGD, as I said, comes in the 1st of July. All dwelling houses started after that date. We, we uh, must comply with the regulations. There's no planning exemption. I had questions. Uh, uh, why, what, what, about, uh, what about if I've started? 
if you started the dwelling, then the building regulations that existed before the 1st of July applies. If you start after the dwelling after the 1st of July, then it's after. Does that mean you could have different requirements on the same estate? Absolutely. You could have one, one, one side of the estate running with alarms just in the uh, living room uh, kitchen and in the actual corridors, and in the rest of the house you also had to have them in the bedrooms. Because remember, under a, under a High Court uh, decision in, in 2003, the building regulations applies to when the work started. Okay? Uh, did I jump one there? I, okay. Um, so, what are the changes itself in the TGD rather than in the legislation? And remember the TGD are prima facie compliance that you've complied with the legislation. But the legislation is what you technically you have to comply with. And legally what you have to comply with. What we've done, the biggest change probably that we've made is that we've new, made a new purpose group, purpose group 1D, uh, which is community dwelling houses. We were asked to do this by the HSE and by some of the um, um, charitable organizations because under the, the strategy for decongregation of institutional buildings to communities, um, they were moving people out into community dwellings, uh, st style dwellings, uh, but at the same time they were obliged then to actually meet the requirement of purpose group 2A, which, uh, which was uh, seen as a bit excessive and was costing a fortune to actually do. What we've designed here is that you can actually move them out into what's known as a community dwelling as long as you meet certain criteria. And in that instance, we've then reduced the standard. But there are assumptions in that. So we have a higher level than a dwelling, but lower than a purpose group 2A. Um, uh, and, but it only applies in certain circumstances, only three stories, only eight bedrooms. Um, and, but they don't attract a fire safety cert or a disabled access cert. There was a calculation done, if you take an existing house to change it to the community dwelling standard, it'll cost about 40,000. To change it into a purpose group 2A, it'll cost 140,000. And so my own personal view is that if you're build, if for charitable organizations, or indeed any organization that's building them, the HSE, if you're building it new, I go for a purpose group 2A so that you can accommodate all categories of people with disabilities. I would go for, uh, if you're converting one, I would go for a community dwelling and limit the, the, the uses of it. Um, so there's your, there's your uh, community dwelling house. That's what you're defining it as. What have we done? As I said, three stories, 30 minute fire resistance to all. Doesn't matter about the height. So in the other, in, in the normal house, if you're, you're a half hour, full half hour fire resistance only occurs in three stories. It's nominal half hour before that, it's full in a story. In these houses, it doesn't matter if it's a bungalow. We still want a, a full protected corridor so that you can have time to escape because of the disabilities that you may have. Um, oh, we were hopping all over the place. Uh, also, it's an LD1 system. LD1 fire detection alarm system to IS3218. And it also has a control switch which tells you where the actual, you can silence all the rest and it tells you where the actual fire will be. Uh, and obviously we have alarms in uh, all the bedrooms and the other attic spaces. That's what an LD1 system uh, gives you. Okay. We introduced, through the fire services, we wrote a, a fire safety and community dwelling houses, a colleague and myself, uh, for, for these. This not just goes through the, the, um, the fabric elements which are in the TGD, but also the management element and the assessments that's required. And that, that applies obviously then not just to new build, which building regulations would apply to, but it also applies to uh, houses that are now being used as community dwelling houses. Okay, so that's a, an important document. You can download it from, the, from there as well. Um, okay, back to the main changes to the TGD. Main changes, fire detection analysis from the LD2 system. I call it the PADI LD2 system. I'm not particularly happy with it. Because if you were, if any of you from that are across the border, you'll understand that an LD2 system in the UK is different now to an LD2 system in Ireland, and I'm not particularly happy with that. It would have been nicer if they put it as an advanced LD2 system. Our LD2 system requires you not to, not only to have it in all the areas we previously had. This thing is wild, uh, but also to, uh, or me, it's one of the two of us. Uh, uh, but it not only it requires you that, but it also requires you to have it in all the bedrooms, all the bedrooms. 
as well as all the other areas, the, the, the risk areas. That's our LD2 system. As I say, you need to be careful. You have people, you have contractors that come across from the border working in the south, and they say, oh, you have to do it to an LD2 system, and they do it to the UK LD2 system, which is non-compliant. Uh, in that sense, I, I, I don't <coughs> like it. Um, also, new extensions. If you're doing a new extension, you put it in an alarm system. But there's also a scenario where you may have to put it in the existing house. Normally, the building regulations do not require, except for change of use, the, nor, the, nor, the building regulations do not require you to do works in an existing building unless you're doing a material alteration and then it's only to the, to the works that you are doing. In this scenario, if you're caught, and I'll show it to you for a second, here. So, you, you put on an extension at the back, if I get this pointer right, and you have an enclosed garden out the back, which would happen a lot in, in cities where you have the garage was developed beside it and you have no way out on the side and then you're surrounded on both sides and at the back with another housing estate. And so what happens there is you have an enclosed garden. If you don't have this distance, in other words, if you don't have a safe place, you Martin talked about going to point F, I think, outside for fire early on for safety. That's the spot. And if you can't have that, then you must alarm the actual building itself so that if you're sitting out here having a drinks in the evening and the, the, uh, the child sets the place on fire inside, then you'll know at least that the place is on fire and get out. Okay? That's, that's another change that's happened. Other change. Um, in, the, in the current 2006 document, we say when you're replacing windows, it is recommended. We've changed that now for dwellings. If you're... If you're, if you're doing a dwelling, if you're putting new windows in a dwelling, you should meet as far as is practical. We've put that in because we're not asking you to break bigger holes in the wall and exist, but you should try to meet the actual escape. So in a normal, in a normal house, in anything that's built in the last 50 years, you, you will be able to meet the fire requirements and you should meet the fire requirements for escape, for an alternative means of escape in it. And in the case of all other rooms, you shouldn't make it any worse. That's always a rule, by the way. That's always a rule in the building regulations. It says you can do no new or greater conflict to the building regulations. So if you have a building that doesn't comply, you can't make it worse. If, you, if it does comply, you can't then create a non-compliance by works you do. That's there in the primary act. You can't do that. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yes. Um, uh, readily openable. I had a question here, I had a question actually in from uh, some building control during the day, during the week, yesterday actually. And anyway, um, the readily openable applies to the primary route. The primary route, it's like here, the primary route for escape is up there and out there. In a house, it's along the corridor. If you're in a bungalow, it's along the corridor and out the front door. If you're in a two-story or three-story, it's down the stairs and out the front door. So that door must be readily openable now. It used to always apply in a three-story building anyway because you had a protected corridor. It wasn't much sense a protected corridor and you're getting down to the bottom and discovering that the keys are in where the fire are. You must have a readily openable. Now it's applying to all dwellings. Readily openable uh, primary. You don't have to have it on the patio door or on the back door. That was the question I was asked. No, it doesn't apply to them except if you had a patio door that was acting as an escape route for an inner room scenario or in a two-story house where the patio was out onto your balcony where you were looking over a, the, the river Carob, for example, there, then, and that was acting as your alternative means of escape, then you'd actually have to have that readily openable as well. But otherwise, no. Uh, the other thing is we require a PV uh, provisions on isolation of the PV. Um, that's the PV arrays. That's the big in thing at the moment for renewables is, is PV. That's fine. But in the event of fire, you have to have a situation that it isolates the actual uh, DC side. Um, so imagine you have a fire, fireman goes in, their automatic thing is they pull the main fuse on the outside, uh, 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 the, the AC side, and that kills everything inside, so he's, he's feeling very safe, except that your inverter here is down in the utility, and it's got a 20-foot line above in the attic that's all still live from your PV above on the roof. And when he pulls out the ceiling to try and pull the fire, he connects that and gives himself a very, as, uh, shall we say, puts some sparkle in his eyes, to say the least. You know, you're talking about maybe 800 volts uh, that you'll actually get off that, you know? So uh, it's smarting a lad up, to say the least, you know? So, 
There are other ways of complying with this, by the way. There are other ways of complying with this, and we've come up with what one might call a more practical. So, so th th there's a fire safety switch that you can use that when you pull, when he pulls the fuse outside, it automatically, it's a 60, 15 second delay, but it automatically then kills it as it comes in. So you'd be bringing your PV array uh, line, your DC line in through the fire, uh, fireman switch and then down to your inverter. The other option is put the inverter up where it should be and leave less than a meter from there in. That's what, that's a picture there. I, 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 we had. Uh, some consultation with some consultants and they made up a mock-up out in the house that I went out to in Dublin uh, and you can do it that way so that the when you bring the PV array into the into the building you shorten the length of what's going to be DC live and so when you pull the fuse outside it kills it as far as the inverter there and therefore you only have a very short piece of wire so it doesn't present, it present the risk that it should so you've eliminated the risk other thing that we have is galleries a gallery <coughs> is another story, just to be clear. A gallery is another story in which you must comply with the requirements of 132, 133, or 134. So that's one story, or two story, three story, or whatever. Except where? This is the exception, but it's the exception as long as you meet these requirements. Oops, there we go. As long as we meet these requirements, so that it's 50, not, not greater than 50% of the room, three meters from the <coughs> stairs out to the door, 7.5 meters across there, and it can't be ha a, a sleeping area. So you can sit up there and have your drinks and uh, uh, tut at the world, or you can look at, over the lovely vista across the river car up there, or whatever, but you can't be sleeping up there. Be comatose after a few drinks, you can't be doing that because then you won't know to get out, and you'll have the fire underneath, and you'll be, we'll have another fatality. Okay. This is a big change, guys. This is a big change. We used to have diagram 17, and every builder in the country uh, uh, said, oh, I'm complying with diagram 17, so I don't need a cavity barrier. We've taken that diagram away because diagram 17 was never complied with in the first place. And because it was, you, you, you could comply with it, have all your ropes sealed, and then your man comes in for the dryer and drills a hole through and puts a nice little old plastic bitting of a pipe in and the minute you have a fire it goes shooting straight into your cavity and not only do you burn your own house down but you burn the neighbours down as well. So in this case you must have, we are now requiring, and you saw it in the external insulation as well, that's also a requirement of the external insulation. There, you must have a cavity barrier that comes from the, uh, that's your party wall, you come across, it must uh, uh, extend out to the to the inner face of the outer leaf, whatever that outer leaf is made of. And you'll see where it breaks, so that's non-combustible or limited combustibility. So, that's, so that could be any insulation, expanded polystyrene, carbon enhanced expanded polystyrene, polyisocyanurate, uh, uh, or PIR as it's known, but then you must break it there. Ah, come back. So it must break it there in order to make sure that, that. You also need cavity barriers, of course, now at the top of the walls. Historically, you always did, by the way. But we got it there because everybody put a block on the top. Now we've taken away the block because of the side value that it creates at the interface between the ceiling and the wall, and you get co-bridging at that point, so we've taken it away. But you need a cavity barrier. Otherwise, anything gets in, the cavity goes shooting straight up, and the roof's on gone. And you're, you're sitting down inside having the cup of tea, and the roof's on fire. That happened actually in a swords case, it was, slightly, it was a timber frame where a guy went torching. He was doing a, uh, he was doing a torch, um, fixing a, a minor leak on a, on a flat roof section on a timber frame building and he, he, uh, he caught the insulation inside, or not the, uh, he caught the actual felt inside, it shot through the cavity and up, uh, bypassed all the cavity barriers in, the, in, in this, uh, it was an 11, 11 house block and, and straight up, so inside in the house you didn't know anything was happening at all, but the whole roof was on fire and all the cavity and the structure that was actually supporting the roof was also on fire from the inside, from inside in the cavity. These are your cavity barriers, that applies, that applies now to all houses, to all, all, all dwelling houses, okay? Okay, last one on, on part B, and I, the only reason I, I, I put this in is Euro codes and the fire pass of the Euro codes. The Euro codes came in in 2010, <coughs> They were uh, mandated in the Texan Guidance Document A in 2012. And the Euro codes assume a fire protection of the structures. And when it assumes that, uh, that fire protection, it is, the performance is based on the European test method, not BS476. 
It's E in 1365, 1364, and 1366. These are the Eurocode Euro methods. And you'll notice that the thickness of slabs uh, I, um, will have increased in a lot of cases. I've been having great fun burning stuff over in England, but it was legal. It was in Warrington in the test lab. And uh, we've discovered uh, quite shockingly that a lot of the stuff isn't, ma isn't making the requirements. So I issued guidance, by the way, three, four weeks ago uh, on timber frame walls and separating party walls. And by the end of this month or beginning of April, I intend to issue another uh, guidance on um, web joists. The web joists have become uh, very common uh, as a use because you can get your heat recovery ventilation system in through them because of the, the weaving of the actual metal web. Um, but they don't have the same thing as a solid joist. So there'll be, there, I'll be issuing guidance on both the fire resistance underneath and also any penetrations in them. Same thing with regard to trusses. Trusses where you need a fire resistance, for example, in a three-story building or in a two-story with an attic converted. You, that has to be a full half hour fire resistance. We were uh, testing over in England uh, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, a, a truss in the proper manner. We're not very happy with some of uh, the, the, the testing that has gone on. We, we've developed, uh, so uh, you need to be very, very careful. But I hope to issue further guidance on that in the next three, four weeks. Uh, so, but that's why I mentioned that. Any of the tests you're talking about, it should be to the European test method. Okay, where are we? So that's volume, volume two, as we call it, dwelling houses. This is, we're at this stage now with technical guidance document uh, 2006. We're going on with the revision of that for buildings other than dwelling houses. And what's happening uh, there is uh, we are hoping to get it out to public consultation um, by the end of this year, some stage late in the year. It always goes for three months public consultation because that's a standstill period in Europe anyway. We must inform Europe every time we bring in a building regulation. And then uh, we'll finalize it next year. And there will be a potentially a, a longer transitional period for that because imagine that you've developed or you, you have a Terminal 3 in Dublin Airport ready to go and then we bring in something. So there will be a transitional period on that. But um, obviously it's also that, that, that document is, to be honest with you, I, 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 I'm not very happy with where we were with it and so we're, we're probably changing a substantial amount of it right this minute. And of course it, then it's also influenced by the, uh, the Grenfell disaster. Um, uh, just what we're looking at that and looking at uh, what the reports say on that as well. Um, so uh, th that's where we are with, with text and guidance that can be. Right, the other one that I've been asked to talk about is, uh, mm, excuse me, is uh, near zero energy buildings. So that's, this is where we're talking about. This is what, we're, it, everything's driven by the energy performance of buildings directive. Just about everything energy, um, calling an SEAI whose name I can't remember, uh, but I, and apologies for that. I never can remember anyone's names. But um, they, they, th that's what's been driven, uh, that's what's driving more or less everything we've done in the last few years with regard to energy. Um, so it, it, it says basically, member states should ensure that all new buildings are nearly zero energy buildings by 31st of December 2020. And that's a strange one because the way they actually say it is that they should buildings on completion. Now we always say buildings starting from a date. That's not the way Europe did. They said buildings, building, uh, being <coughs> occupied by 2020, which kind of leaves a kind of a strange one. And I, I know that my colleague Sean Armstrong uh, made the point at Europe, said, well, we have a fair few buildings started back in a while back that, uh, that, 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 that isn't going to meet that one. Uh, member states, near this area, start to first for, for public buildings. And then major renovations to be cost optimal. And actually, our AECOM that we're talking here this morning, they did the cost optimal analysis for us under contract. So that's it, very low. So basically, and again, back to uh, the colleague in the SAI, exactly that. We've always said, first you reduce your energy requirement, and then you get the, the best, most efficient way of providing the beginning of energy that you do need. And they're saying, and some of that has to be from renewables, preferably on, on, or on site or near site. There's the RTE, <coughs> RTE PV array there. So for major renovations, 25% of the surface of the building envelope uh, undergoes renovation. Just to be clear, when you talk about that, that's the thermal envelope. 
So that's not just the walls, it's also the ceiling and the floor, 25%. Not, not just the walls. So if you're doing windows alone, that's not going to make up your 25% and it doesn't kick you in into something else. But we're looking at that uh, when, when at the moment. Um, the other thing is a minimum energy performance is technically, functionally, and economically feasible. If there was ever an out, that's it. But we, we, we have to work out what that exactly means as well. And we, we are on an, under an infringement from Europe. They, they, they don't seem to like us in Europe. Um, they, they seem to like, love to fire an infringement against us any time if we don't move fast enough. Uh, and we're on a, we were, uh, Martin mentioned, I was involved in the infringement uh, and the court case uh, on wastewater treatments. Uh, and uh, with the wastewater one by, back in the day, and they fined us 2.7 million and 12,000 a day for uh, every day that we weren't in compliance. Uh, uh, and they have the potential to do the same. They, they can do that in any, when they take an infringement against us. So uh, we have to act fairly promptly when we do get an infringement against us. So, uh, okay, so what's happening in dwellings? Well, you all know this already. Ah, uh, come back. Right, we're, uh, it's, it's definitely a dangerous thing here. Uh, so, in, back, in, back, back uh, in 2005, it was ab about a, uh, a, a C1, uh, 160 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. We then, we, we took that as the baseline in 2005. We took that as the baseline, and then in 2007, we want a 40% improvement. So we got an EPC of 0.6. In 2011, we said we're 60% improvement. So we got an EPC of 0.4 and a CPC of 0.45. And it looks like where we're going now is 70% improvement on, on the base house in 2018. It'll be, it'll be equate to a BER of, 40, uh, of uh, an A2, uh, uh, nearly zero indoors. So that's, that's where we're going, at, seven, at 10%. That's not too bad, actually, because we're nearly there already in the 60%. It'll only, it won't mean as much as we'll say if we weren't, if we weren't there already to a certain degree. So that's what we have. I remember Partel now, uh, is that's what we require. That's, that's what we require, uh, 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 an EPC of 0.4, right? And a CPC of 0.45. Cotton regs, that still stays. What are we doing? So again, Europe, they didn't like the fact that we hadn't told people. So we had to do an emergency uh, amendment, SI4 amendment to the tech and guidance document, just to tell you where you were going. So. Back in 2017, we put in that we're going, that near zero in Ireland will mean an EPC of 0.3 and a, a CPC of 0.35. We said that back in 2017 to tell you where we're going, but it doesn't apply yet. We just had to tell you where you're going so that if your designers out there building houses for or designing for 2020 or whatever, that you'll know where, what you should be designing to. So that's where it is. Um, a full review of, of, of the dwellings, that's actually ongoing. Public consultation, we're going by, we, uh, my colleague Sean is, is working feverishly in conjunction with actually uh, colleagues in SEAI. <coughs> in fact, I was supposed to be at a meeting this morning on, on it uh, to develop um, uh, the document part L, it'll be 2018 or 2019, be 2018. But uh, so it's going to public consultation by the end of this month. We'll hope to have it finalized in potentially September. It depends on the comments and, of course, on the minister. The, it's all, the minister has the final say in most of these. But again, as we are under infringement, uh, we will be pushing to get this out. Where has it gone again? Um, and uh, then it'll apply in early 20, uh, 2019, maybe either applicable from either April or June or something like that in 2019. So that's where we're going with dwellings, but we already know where we're going. So in real terms, in real terms, we know that this, and we know this, it's a question of how do we achieve it? How do we achieve it? That's, that's actually where, 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 where it's going. Um, so it'll be advanced fabric performance, improved air tightness, uh, calculating the thermal bridges, renewables, and review of uh, ventilation provisions. So uh, we're probably going, the fabric, as stated in Annex E of Technical Guidance Document L right now, probably won't change much. The default, the, the, the backstop values as they're known, will probably come down from 0.21 to 0.18 for a wall and probably point, uh, for, a, for the glazing from uh, 1.6 to probably 1.4 and stuff like that. 
but they're the default. In real terms, to make the EPC and the CPC, you're always going down lower than that anyway. They're, those backstop values are to prevent you from saying, you know, I won't put any insulation in the house at all, put a rake of PV out in the garden and on the, on the chicken shed and every other place, and I, I, I'll still make an EPC, which technically you could do. But that means then you're not actually, in the first instance, reducing your energy demand. And that's the first criteria, reduce your energy demand, then provide the energy that you do need in the best and most efficient way possible. So that's where we're probably going. Air tightness will probably be coming down from seven cubic meters per hour per square meter to about five cubic meters per hour per square meter at 50 pascals. Um, renewables, renewables potentially, I don't know whether I have a slide in here, no. Uh, renewables will most likely will be changing from 10 kilowatt hours per square meter uh, which is what we have now, to, uh, to a percentage. That's what's happened in uh, uh, TGDL non-domestic, and that's what, uh, most likely where we're going to be going with that. It'll be, it'll be going to a percentage of the energy required uh, for the dwelling once you've brought it down to a level, uh, rather than a, 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 a dead 10, a 10 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter, okay? So, Major renovations. This is one that we're still teasing out. What it says is, again, 25% of the surface of the building envelope, if you do that, then you end up having to do other ones to a cost optimal. And as I said, a ACOM did some calculations on cost optimal, and they're coming up for various different houses, cost optimal is in the order of a B3. So we're, we're not clear where that brings us, where if you, if you take the G houses that you're talking about and you're doing some work, it will trigger you into doing something else. That looks like what is going to happen. What that actually means, we're, we're, we're teasing out, that will come out uh, will, uh, in the public consultation later on this month and in the final document later on this year. Um, but it, that, that could be potentially o onerous, you know, uh, it, it's not clear, but, you know, uh, it, it could be potentially onerous uh, where, you, where you intended doing works, you know, because it, it may force you into those. In a lot of cases, it may only force you into doing um, um, a, a new boiler and stuff like that. We don't, we, we, we don't fully know. Right. Part of, uh, other than dwelling houses. Uh, this is out. So we had extensive consultation on the stakeholders. Uh, we had, <coughs> we gave hints at what NZEB would be for public building back in, in 2017. We had to do that. Uh, uh, then a TGDL uh, buildings other than dwellings, that's, that's already published, downloadable from our website. And it comes into force next January. No choice, comes into force next January, right? Um, what does it mean? Um, where are we gone? Yes. For once, it didn't jump on for me. So uh, is, is, this is, we've done this slightly different. So whereas before, whereas before, we we based it on the uh, under for dwellings, we based it on the 2005 house, and we said, no, now you're reducing it, reducing it, reducing it. In the part L, we didn't get to actually renew to do it, so we've jumped in. So what what's in part L is in fact is in fact your, um, your compliant near, ze near zero bil uh, building for, no uh, for non-dwellings. And what you will end up with doing is having an EPC of one. In other words, you equal what's in the document. And it equates to a 60% improvement on the 2008 document, uh, improved fabric specification, advanced services, renewables. <coughs> There'll be a requirement for renewables, again, of 20% of the energy required. But if you go below the parameters as specified in the appendix, uh, it's appendix C, then you can potentially reduce your renewables to 10%. Okay, so there's a, hold on now, we just, yeah. So there's a comparison. There's a comparison of just for a very quick, so right now on the 2008, the curtain one, your walls are, you, you must have your walls at not, not a U value of not higher than 0 0.27. That's gonna be changed into 0 0.18 for to make it. Now that's not the backstop. The backstop will be 0.21, but to actually be able to make the, U, the, the, the EPC of one, it'll be 0.18 or better. Uh, roofs down to 0 0.15 and floors 1.5. These are also air tightness. It's 10 at the moment in a building other than dwelling houses. 
Uh, that'll go to five where the area is less than 200, that's gone to five where it's less than 250 square meters, and down to three <coughs> where it's greater than 250 square meters. Uh, when do you value? Two, uh, come back. Uh, when do you value? 2.2. <coughs> it goes, <coughs> it's going to 1.4. That's, that's, that's no big deal. It's only, it, that might give you a problem though where you have big windows or, or stuff like that. Um, solar, solar energy transmittance of 0 0.4. Uh, that, there's your, basically most of it, uh, 75 litres and, and uh, 1.8 watts per, per litre uh, second. So, uh, and variable <coughs> speed fans, you'll need variable speed fans rather than what you have now, you could have just a one speed one. So, it's, 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 so the controls have tightened up. There's a requirement for renewables now. So there's all of that. And so that's where we're at with buildings other than dwellings near zero. That's in, by the way, lads, that's in. That will apply from the 1st of January next year. Uh, so, um, the transitional arrangements, I'll be probably heading out the door now with planning permissions just to try and get them in, but basically, the way the transitional arrangements on this one works is that all works, basically the building regulation, it comes in the 1st of January, but if you have the work started, if you have the work started, by the 31st of December, then obviously it's the existing building regulations. That's the way all building regulations apply, by the way. If you have the work started before the regulation comes in, then it's the works that apply at the time. I give this example that, for example, the houses that were started in 2006, it's the building regulations that applied in 2006 that apply to those now, even though you're finishing them today. It's not the building regulations of today that apply. It's the building regulations that apply when you started the work. However, if you didn't start the work, but you have planning permission in place, well then, before the 31st of December, then you can work to the old regs, but you must have it substantially complete by the 1st of January 2020, which only gives you a year, right? So if you haven't started the work by, by, by the end of this year, but you have planning permission in place, for example, then you, 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 can, you can go ahead with under the old regime, but you must have it substantially complete. And substantially complete, as defined by the High Court again back in 2003, was at wall plate level. Okay, that's some of the ones in the projects going on, OPWB building in Leeson Street, ESP headquarters, and the forensic labs. Um, major renovations, again, we're back to this. Now, in these ones, it, it, it potentially means it, it's easier. 25% uh, of the surface, if you do more than that, then you may end up having to upgrade inefficient heating systems. But that's if they're 15 years old and they only have a certain performance. There's two criteria involved there. Uh, the same way, upgrade inefficient cooling systems. Again, if they're 15 years old, or uh, they have a certain, there's certain criteria within the TGDL, I haven't put it in here, uh, that the, the, of the efficiency. And then upgrade inefficient lighting systems. So that's where that is. You can get, go on to the website, Building Standards, Click on that, you can find world of stuff in there, okay? Thank you very much. Now, I have your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Um, start our last speaker before lunch is uh, Oliver Mahan. Uh, Oliver is a GMIT graduate in civil engineering and is now senior vice president of CRH, one of our uh, very largest companies. Uh, his responsibility for CRH businesses in Ireland and Spain. Uh, during his career with CRH, Oliver has uh, also had responsibility for uh, diverse CRH businesses in places as far as India and Finland, to name but two. Uh, so today Oliver's going to tell us a little about his career after leaving GMIT, uh, some of the scope of CRH, uh, and also to consider maybe some of the future directions in building materials and products. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Um, as Martin said, my name is Oliver Mahan. I uh, am a, a former graduate of GMIT. I came here in 86, did two years here, did a civil engineering technician course. Uh, after two years, I moved on then, went to Dublin, into Bolton Street, did a diploma in structural engineering, and went on then and did a degree in, uh, in Bolton Street as well, and graduated in 91. Um, during my time in, in, in college, I did some summer work for Roadstone, and straight after I graduated in 91, I joined Roadstone, and I've been with them since. <coughs> um, I suppose Roadstone is part of the CRH group. Uh, it's the, the R in the CRH, and I'll, I will, will, I'll tell you a little bit about that. I'm also very conscious I am standing between you and your lunch, so I'll tip on this at a, at a, at a fair pace. Um, a little bit about CRH, I suppose CRH was formed in 1970. Uh, two Irish companies, uh, Roadstone and Irish Cement, came together, uh, formed, the merged in 1970, uh, started off, you know, 100% Irish-based company with a revenue of about 28 million and about 5,000, uh, just over 5,000 employees. Through the, the 70s and 80s, we, we expanded into, into Europe first, then into America, built up businesses in going into an area, buying a business, a f usually a family-run business in America. We'd put in a financial, a financial person to look after the checkbook. We left the management in place. We left the, the company name in place. And we worked with the management team that was there, and we grew and developed the business. And we, we liked to buy businesses in areas where we could build, buy more and build on and expand. <coughs> I suppose our goal was always to become number one or number two in any of the local markets we were in. Because we felt that in our, in our business, if you were down number three, four, five, six, you were at nothing. You had to be in the top two, really, to make an impact in the, in, 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 in the local businesses. So we built that up through the, right through the 80s into the 90s, um, I suppose. Uh, in, in the 2000s, then, we moved into Asia. We looked at Asia. We, we went, to, uh, went to Asia in 2001, and we spent eight years looking at different businesses, and we bought our first business, uh, a small cement business in China, um, up in, in, in the northeastern <coughs> part of China. Uh, then that moved on, we were able to buy, buy into another business. But in China, you can't own more than, than a per certain percentage, so we were able to own 26% of a business in China. Huge scale but a tough place to do business, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a while. Then we moved into India. We bought a 50% stake in a, of a business in India, uh, down in, in uh, Andhra Pradesh in southern India, and we built on, and, and we expanded that over time as well. But also, huge opportunities in, in Asia, but huge risk and huge challenges as well. Then we, we continued, we put in our... Uh, our Asia head office in Singapore in about 2013, and then the wholesome assets came available. This was two businesses that came together. They were the number one, number two in the industry. They came together, they merged. As a result, they had to sell off some of their assets. So in 2015, we were lucky enough to buy seven, seven billion um, euros worth of assets, which really moved us into a different place. So from very, very humble, small beginnings in Ireland in 1970, we moved on. We're the number, number two worldwide at the moment. We have uh, sales of just under 30 billion a year. We have about n over 90,000 employees. Uh, we're number one in America uh, in, in, the, con in, in the, the, the construction materials business. Um, we're in 31 countries around the world. Uh, and I suppose we have a very clear goal. Our chief executive is Albert Manifold. Very clear goal to be number one in the building materials uh, uh, space, but also to be you know, number one company across all sectors. So that's, that's our goal going forward. So what do we do? I suppose we have our businesses broken up into three different types. We have heavy side businesses, which really is concrete, asphalt, cement, uh, contracting, that part of the business. Then we have light side businesses, which we call, you know, their glass, their <coughs> fix, fittings and fixtures. If you look in, 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 in this room here, we have a huge amount of, of fittings that are holding on panels that 
that our companies would, would manufacture. These are usually, you know, we call them light side. They're lightweight, they're easy to transport around the place. They have to be, you have to be very efficient, you have to be very uh, quick to, mar to change, and you have to, you know, really be, 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 be moving with the market demands, and they're usually quick. And then we have the whole distribution business, uh, building materials distribution businesses, that's DIY stores, it's uh, building merchants, big around Europe, um, we're 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 not in, <coughs> we don't have it in Ireland, uh, but around Europe we're we'd be number one in in uh, Central Europe really. Uh, we had it in uh, strong business like that in America. We just sold it off there in January, and we reinvested the money into our cement, uh, other cement businesses in the U.S. So, listen, I won't go into the detail there. That's that's really what we are. Thirty, you know, just under under thirty billion. Uh, sales a year and an EBITDA 3.3. A um, little bit about America, as I said, number one in Europe in, in, um, in, in the building materials. Um, we're in all the states in America, we're in, in Canada as well. Uh, we're just, just growing all the time and, and developing all the time and, and, and moving on. In Europe, we're on the heavy side materials, we're number one. We, we, we're big into vertical integration, where that means we, we like to, to own the aggregates, the rock on the ground, we like to own the cement plants to produce the cement, and then we like to bring that down through ready mix concrete, get it out, get it in through asphalt. Um, and about a third of our, our model really is about a third of our, of our product we supply directly to ourselves, which we move on then into the, um, into the in, in, in through the through the, the customer chain uh, in Asia, as I said, we were very much in India and China, and then with the Halsam, with the Halsam Lafarge deal, we acquired a fine business in the Philippines. Um, again, huge potential here, and we'll talk a little bit about that going forward. Uh, huge potential over the coming years, but an awful lot of risk. We've been in China, and we've we we have fine business in China. We have about. Um, we produce about 9 million tonnes of cement in China a year. When you consider in, in Ireland, we, we produce about, about three. So fine business in, in, in China, but very hard to make money. <coughs> you know, the, the main customer is the government. Your main competitor is the government. Our partner is the government. So you know, everything is controlled by the government. You know. So it's a hard place to make money, but, but there's huge potential. In other parts uh, of, of Asia, uh, great opportunities, but challenges as well. There's a lot of talk about sustainability here and the performance of sustainability. We're heavily engaged in that. We do an awful lot of work with that. We're linked into different organizations, and it's a big part of what we do and what, where, where, where we, we, we want to get to. So, a little bit about the future. We've spent an awful lot of time and money and, and, and expertise looking at where we see the materials business going and how technology is going to interfere with that in the coming years. And, and the only thing I can say is whatever we, I put up here is our view, and I'm sure it's wrong, but it's, 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 it's like looking into a bucket of milk. You, know, you really don't know what's in there. It's, it's just taking a stab of it at it, but this is our view. I suppose what we'd say is that there are four fundamentals that shape the, the world, and we'd have seen it that um, industrialization and urbanization is huge. <coughs> An example, in India, 10 million people each year move from the country regions into the cities. 10 million people each year. Uh, so there's cities being built to cope with that at a huge rate in India. That's happening right across the world. Uh, you know, it's happening right across the world. It's estimated that 65 million people are going to move from rural areas into cities. And that's where we see the growth and that's where we're planning for growth in the future. It's, it's our view that by 2025, four-fifths of all development is going to happen in cities. It's going to be for all focused around cities, so that's where, where we're looking at. We talk about technologies and disruptive technologies, and McKinsey's, who are, who are well-renowned <coughs> consultants, they've come up with 12 disruptive technologies that they feel are going to change the world over the, over the coming years. And already we've seen that last year. We ourselves have been personally hit by, by um, uh, the, the hackers, the hit is in, in one of our businesses in the Ukraine. We were working away merrily and all of a sudden we just lost everything. Uh, 
and when you talk about your production facilities, they're high tech, the state of the art plant and equipment that's there, <coughs> it's the latest technology that's out there. And in the space of, uh, I think it took 23 seconds from the time that they got into the system till they completely wiped us out and, and stopped us. So that's very disruptive. Um, and we have all the firewalls and all the safety, the safety procedures and processes you can take, but you, you can get hit and, and we, we got hit. Uh, global interconnections. Interconnect I suppose this really is the amount of trade that's, that's happening globally across the world, and it's a huge change. And we have seen that uh, you know it has increased tenfold since since 1990. And in the last in the last uh, five years, it has it has tripled. So that's um, that's a serious um, <coughs> a way people are doing business and their, their interactions around the business. And I suppose the other thing that we see going to hit the hit the, the world in uh, in the coming years is it's an aging world an aging population the um, the population of 65 year olds at the moment it has doubled uh, or it's expected to double sorry uh, from 2000 to 2050 and it's expected to triple in emerging markets and you think of the life expectancy in emerging markets at the moment is quite low and the advances that's being made in in, in medicine that the life expectancy is, is going to incre increase greatly in, in emerging markets. And think of the pressure that's going to put on resources, put on even, even to, to, you know, to house, and, and, and the pressure is going to put on, on resources and, and uh, demands it's going to make are going to be huge. Th this is an interesting one. This, this really just outlines <coughs> the, a little bit of how technology has moved so quickly. And how the time it has taken for, you know, uh, different technologies to hit 50 million users. And if you look at the radio, it took 38 years from once radio um, was introduced. It took 38 years before 50 million people used it. You move on to the internet, it took three years. You move on to, to Pokemon, it took one month. So you see the way technology is changing and, and how fast things are changing. But there, we believe that there are six market fundamentals that are key to construction and I suppose the first one is and we, we heard about it from the last two speakers um, particularly about the last speaker construction people don't like things falling down so construction is based on on mass and strength and for that concrete uh, and and building pr and building material products are key to that um, I suppose if you ever go to Rome you'll see that the concrete was first used in Rome in back in Roman times, 2,000 years ago, is still standing there today. Portland cement was only in, was only invented <coughs> in, in 1824, you know, and it hasn't really changed a whole lot since. Okay, technology in producing it has changed, and it's more efficient and it's smarter to do it. But it's still the same basic you basic ingredients you take out of the ground, you put them through a heat process, you you, you form clinker, you grind it down, and next thing you make cement. It hasn't changed a whole lot. In, in, in the last uh, last hundred years. Construction markets are local. You have to be close to the market. You know, we would see that the cost of, of transport and product is about 15% of the total cost of the product. So if you look at it there, we say that ready mix usually about 15, 15 kilometers. Cement can usually travel about 150 kilometers. Then it starts to get, get expensive. Um, we talk about uh, construction accessories, you know, as they talk about the fittings and the fixtures, they can really go anywhere because they're lightweight. Construction materials are usually heavy and the cost of moving them is, 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 is important. And that's why we believe it has to be, you have to be local to it. The other thing is that the construction, um, the global construction industry is going to continue to grow. 2015 it was 8.8 .8 trillion. Dollars. That's about 12% of the global GDP. That's forecasted to grow at about three, excluding China, because I don't know what's going to happen in China. Uh, the growth, the growth patterns there have been pretty, pretty crazy, but we're not sure. If we're, so excluding China, we feel that it's going to grow by about 3.4% up to about about 30.30. And I suppose how people interact with business, uh, with with buildings, and what they expect from buildings. We heard that in. Uh, from Eamon in the last in the last presentation, um, 
And I suppose, you know, we talk, you hear a lot of talk about carbon emissions and a lot of talk about waste and, and waste, waste treatment and generating, generation of waste. An interesting fact is uh, about a quarter of all the waste generated in the US is generated either from the construction of buildings or the demolition of buildings. It's, 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 it's crazy when you, when you think of that. Um, an awful lot of talk, talk about, uh, about CO2 and the cost of CO2, and I'll come to that a little bit later. But CO2, uh, a third of all CO2 is generated from buildings. And the production of cement alone is about 5% of that. And then there's a lot of talk then about natural disasters. And we have to have buildings that are resilient, that are able to stand up. And that's where all of the regulations have come into play, and we've seen that. And that is, at the end of the day, it's about providing a safe place for people to live and to work. Talk about re uh, regulations, and I suppose this is an interesting one. This is the number of US regulations. In, uh, the blue is in 1970, and the orange is 2014. And you, you compare the construction industry, the number of them, look at the, look at the pure size of them, 782 and 82 regulations compared to agriculture, which people are eating. It's in our, you know, people eat <coughs> in the food chain. Agriculture is about 80, so it's nearly 10 times more. And we heard it again today. People do not like buildings falling. They want a safe, safe place to, to live and to work. Uh, and the impact, if a building collapses, it usually makes international news <coughs> if, if, if there's a number of, uh, of fatalities. So a little bit about the product productivity in the construction sector, and I think this is, 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 is an interesting one. You look at agriculture, between 1940s and today, the, production gr the productivity growth has been huge. The same in manufacture, the same in retail. But look at construction, it hasn't, it's only, it has only increased by about 6%. And you say, why is that? And to, to get productivity, it's about standardized, having a standard, standard method of doing it and, and repeating that method on a regular basis. A lot of construction is standalone construction on sites. We'd have seen that there's a change away from cast in situ to precast. Um, I was in Finland last week. In Finland, about, only about 30% of, of concrete is cast on site. 70% is precast concrete. It'd be, it'd be the re complete reverse here in Ireland or in the UK. So they have moved away into precast, precast buildings, and that is in a, uh, to, to to get through the to increase the speed of construction, and the efficiencies. But that's a, that's an interesting an interesting slide. So, what are the, the the realities facing the construction industry? There will be future growth, and this is you know the best economists in the world have come up with this. They expect that there will be gr growth both in in, in new and developed markets and emerging markets. It'll, be, it'll, it'll change. It's expected to grow, and providing Mr. Bush and Mr. Kim don't blow the socks off each other, uh, and there isn't a, a, an, an, out war, a, an a, a outright war, but it's expected that in the US it's going to grow by just under 4%. And you look at, at India, India with the population that's there and the population growth and the amount of people that are moving, it's, it's, it's expected to grow by around 7%. <coughs> the same in the Philippines, quite high. And Europe is probably is probably around two percent, uh, but it will grow. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and when the economy grows, construction grows, and the demand for construction goes, grows. Sustainability, construction. Or a lot of talk about this. Um, I suppose the cost of of I mean, a lot of talk about carbon emissions. In 2005, it there was zero zero cost impact. In 2016, that's 13%. We talk about carbon credits. There was no carbon credits in 2005. People had excess <coughs> carbon credits. In December, if you wanted to buy carbon, this is where you can buy a ton of CO2. If you bought carbon in, in, in December, it was costing you about a five or a ton, may, uh, maybe 5.50 euros per ton. If you buy it today, it's close to nine euro a ton. The view is that that could go to 30 euro a ton. If it does, that's going to drive the cost of materials through the roof. So 
It's estimated that it's, 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 nobody knows. Nobody knows, but it is a cost, and, we, and everybody wants a cleaner, greener environment, but there is a, there is a cost. We talk, there's opportunities as well, huge opportunities. I take out the Philippines. The Philippines, and I call it the three little pigs, they have gone from building low-cost um, shelters and housing out of the local, local resources, which was, which was straw. But they've been hit by a number of uh, you know, adverse weather uh, conditions over a number of years, and they have moved away from that. Then they moved on to building it from timber. They were still being hit, and now they've moved on to, there's a, a, a program put in place by the government to build it out of, out of, uh, out of concrete. Because they don't, want the, they don't want the buildings falling, they want a safe place for their people. They want to save lives. And then I suppose, slow to change. Yeah, why have things changed so slowly in relation to our building products? And I suppose it's about the raw, raw materials and the resources that we have. If you think of it, you know, uh, the demand for ready-mixed concrete globally per year is about 12 billion cubic meters. 12 billion cubic meters. So there's no other substitute product that can meet that, those quantities in relation to aggregates and in relation to, 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 to stone, it's closer to, 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 to 30 billion. So there's nothing, nothing that can have those quantities. And if you think of the, our, our limestone or you think of granite, it's everywhere. You know, everywhere in the world, there's raw materials, there's the basic raw materials. And that's why the construction, and we, we, we talk a lot about technologies, but that's why it's very hard to move away from the, the materials that we're using at the moment because they're available, they're close to market, and they're, they're cheap. Uh, and I think that's important. A ton of, st a ton of stone in, in the US is about $10. It's 5% of the cost of a ton of steel. So a ton of stone is about 5% of the cost of a ton of steel. And it's, it's, it's readily available. Uh, spoke a, a little bit about, about technology and the disruption and impact that it can have. And it's everywhere, everywhere in our, in our business, everywhere we go, technology plays a huge part of it. We, we heard about it earlier, we heard about BIM, you know, you, we, we heard about 3D modeling, e-commerce, all of that. And all you need is for someone to hack in and disrupt that very easily, very easy for that to happen with the way things are gone. Um, and and it, it's, it's, it, it has happened, it's here. So I suppose, wh where do we put a lot of time and effort into? We put an awful lot of time and effort into innovation. How, how can we work with our basic products? We don't want to move away from our basic products. We want to make them better. We want to be smarter with them. We want to make them, uh, you know, move them with the trends. Because if you don't move with the trends, we'll, 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 we'll just lo lose our market, our, our market leadership position. So we have to move with that. So a huge amount of effort goes into the design, into the products, into how we can provide a solution for, for our customers. And our, our customers are the contractors. So how can we make life easier for them to build their businesses in a, in a faster, more efficient way? So th we're, we're constantly looking at innovation. And that's really it in a, in a nutshell. I wanted to skip through because I'm conscious that it's close to lunchtime. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. So uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, as Oliver said uh, we're running a few minutes late, um, so we might uh, take a break for lunch. Uh, if you're guests of GMIT today, uh, the sponsors have kindly uh, uh, provided lunch for us, so there's some lunch vouchers uh, that will be available over in the canteen. Uh, so if you queue up in the main GMIT canteen, uh, we'll meet you at the um, cash desks with some vouchers. Uh, we'll aim to assemble back. Can I have your attention, please, gentlemen? Um, we'll aim to meet back at about uh, 10 past, quarter past two uh, to resume the afternoon session. Thank you.